So um, welcome everybody. It's great to have you all here. I'm going to um, share my screen for a minute. So part of science is learning how to do PowerPoint presentations. Um, so I am Victoria Macenti, and I am the program manager of Wright Lab, which means that I help coordinate the programming that goes on here, which includes scientific seminars from visiting speakers. It includes outreach events like this one. Um, I also coordinate programs uh, that we write proposals for, such as our undergraduate research program. In the summertime, um, we uh, bring in people from the uh, from schools all over, usually undergraduates, postgraduates, and also sometimes, occasionally, rarely, high school students. Um, so if you are interested in opportunities, please feel free to contact me in the summer. We, we do offer a few internships if there's opportunities available. Um, we also, um, so, so I also do PR, I do websites and uh, newsletters and events um, announcements, and I write news articles. So I do a lot of different things here at the lab. Um, I am not a scientist, but I work with scientists. And um, the scientists I work with uh, include um, postdoctoral associates, faculty, students, both undergraduate students and graduate students. And, um, and then I am all, I'm in the administration. So um, we all at Wright Lab work together in a community um, we have about 150 people at any given time. We're affiliated with the Yale Physics Department, which is our home department. So everybody here is a member of Yale Physics. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about, just very briefly about what a postdoctoral associate is because um, a faculty is what a professor is. So you know about professors. A student is somebody who's going to school and there's two levels here, there's graduate and undergraduate uh, students, but you'll be hearing from two postdoctoral associates today, so I wanted to make sure you knew what that meant. Um, a postdoctoral associate is somebody who has finished graduate school, they have their PhD, you can call them doctor, whatever, um, but they're still considered to be training in order to, on the next step for them is to become a faculty member, a professor at a university if they continue an academic career. So they do research, um, positions. These are these are primarily research positions to help continue their training in doing research, and then eventually they apply for faculty positions and become the faculty um, to teach the next generation of scientists. So um, at Wright Lab, uh, you're here to hear about our search for dark matter, but we do a lot more than that. We explore the whole invisible universe. So. Uh, we also, in addition to dark matter, we look for things called neutrinos, which are tiny invisible particles that, you know, came from the beginning of the universe. They come from the sun, too, and, and nuclear reactors. We don't know much about them. We can't detect them, but we're trying to figure out what they are. Um, so uh, that's that's what a lot of what we do <laughs> is things that we can't perceive with our senses um, and that we have to build instruments to perceive. So at Wright Lab, we build instruments and we do the whole scientific process here. We start with the question, we decide what question we wanna ask, and then we design an instrument to answer that question. Then we build that instrument, then we use that instrument, and then we analyze the data from that instrument. We write papers about it. Um, and then we answer the question one way or another. So it's it's pretty cool. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that we are, um, our experiments that we build instruments for and use are in six continents. You can see on this map, uh, those are all, where all of our experiments are. The only one we're not in is Australia. And the the experiments you'll be hearing about today are, I think they're all in Wright Lab. So uh, you can see the pictures at the bottom of the four experiments you'll be hearing about. First is Haystack, then Ray, then Simple, and then the Jack Harris Lab. So uh, without further ado, 
I'm going to turn you over to uh, Sabrina, who is going to talk to you a little bit, give you a little bit of an intro on dark matter. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Can I get a thumbs up or something if you can hear me? Excellent, thank you. Uh, okay, so thank you, Victoria. As she said, my name is Sabrina. I'm a postdoctoral associate here at the Wright Lab. And I'm working on, you know, trying to detect dark matter, uh, which is a very hard thing to do because so far nobody has ever detected dark matter. So perhaps we can start by, you know, trying to, first of all, define what is dark matter. If nobody has ever detected it, then how do we know it even exists, right? So actually, even though we have never seen it, you know, directly, we have seen hints of dark matter. We have seen it indirectly. So there are um, evidence like around us in the universe that there is something that we don't fully understand, that it does not interact with uh, light or, you know, with things that we really know of. Um, it does not, uh, we, we cannot really detect it with our telescopes or, you know, with any of the sensors of any of the technology available right now, nowadays. However, we do know there is something out there and because we cannot see it, we just call it dark matter. Now, uh, one of the examples of, you know, how, how come that we can indirectly see it, but not really see it. So I just want to share my screen for one second to show you one of one example of what I mean by that. Um, let me see. Yes. So I hope you see my screen. Um, so essentially, when we look at galaxies, you know, we, we are pretty familiar, I guess, with what galaxies should look like. We have at the center of it a, a black hole, and then surrounding it, we have a lot of stars, a lot of planets, and at the center of the black hole, as um, I mean, at the center of the galaxy is where most of the matter is concentrated. And as you go further away, you have less and less stars and planets, right? Because the, the, the galaxy has to end at some point. So what we know is that galaxies rotate. Um, and what we expect because of, you know, Newton's uh, mechanics and Einstein's equations is that uh, the places where the matter is mostly concentrated so for instance, at the center, then uh, the rotation would be very fast. But as you move away from it, as you know, get farther away from all the mass concentration, then the, the speed of rotation should be very, very slow. So this is what this red curve is showing you, that as you get farther away, you should see uh, the remaining stars rotating very slowly. However, what we actually observe when we look at galaxies is that the full chunk of a galaxy rotates at the same speed, regardless of how close or far away they are from uh, the center of it. So that's extremely puzzling because it contradicts directly what we understand about gravity. Um, so that was uh, a hint of, you know, of saying, okay, there is, one explanation, which is that there is something there which interacts gravitationally, but we just cannot see it. And they call this, right, like dark matter. Now, even though we don't know what it is, there are a few things that we can rule out. And there are a few things that we, you know, think dark matter should uh, behave like. For instance, we know that it uh, interacts gravitationally. That 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 is, that is what we we see. We also know that it does not interact electromagnetically. So there are there it, there is no light coming out of it. That's why we cannot see it. 
um, we also know that it should be moving slowly because that's the way it can, you know, cluster together and be able to have this macroscopic uh, effect of uh, interacting gravitationally with uh, uh, the rest of the matter that we actually see. Um, so given these hints, we can think of, okay, what are the possible candidates for that matter? Now there are many theories that do not, uh, that uh, establish certain candidates for that matter, but there are a few options. There is not one single solution for that. So here at the right lab, we have a bunch of experiments trying to detect specific types of dark matter. So for instance, there is the possibility that dark matter are uh, particles called WIMPs, which are weakly interactive uh, massive particles. Uh, there is another type of particle, which is the one I am looking for in my experiment, which is called uh, axions, which has a different set of properties. And I will tell you more about them later when I talk about my experiment. Um, there are also some theorists think, okay, perhaps we don't need that matter at all. And actually what ha what's happening here is that we just don't understand gravity well enough and we have to change Einstein's equation. There are some problems with that, uh, with that assumption. I mean, we can think of modifying gravity, but then some other problems arise because of that. So it's not so popular right now. So what we really think is that there is something out there that we cannot see. And I guess what I would like to add is that this is a very, very exciting uh, field of research in physics because it's one of the big questions uh, in, the, in physics. And I would like to now tell you or show you what we do at the lab. And for that, I will uh, let uh, Victoria present our next speaker who is going to show what exactly entails looking for that matter here at the right back. So thank you. Thank you, Serena. So I'm here at the lab with uh, Mike Jewell who will talk to you about his work on Haystack. Hi, thanks, Victoria. Uh, so yeah, so I am working on the Haystack experiment. The Haystack experiment is looking uh, specifically for what we call axion dark matter. So the unique thing about axions is that they're really, really tiny. And so the type of um, thing you're really looking for, there are these particles really behave more like waves than what you would traditionally think of like as a particle. So the way you detect them is similar to how you would detect something like a, a radio wave, for example, which is that you build an antenna that picks up that signal at a specific frequency the same way you would pick up a radio uh, signal at a uh, specific radio frequency, like in your car, for example. Uh, the challenging thing here is twofold. One is that this signal is very, very, very tiny, and so it's, it's challenging to find. And in addition, we don't actually know what mass or what frequency we're really looking for. So there's no theory that tells us exactly what um, frequency the axon would have to be at for it to solve this dark matter problem. Um, but uh, our antenna can only pick up signals at a very specific frequency. And so the way we operate this is very analogous to, let's say, you're looking for a specific song on the radio station, but you're not sure what station you're looking for. And so you start by tuning to different radio frequencies or different radio stations. You sit there, you listen for a little bit of time to kind of determine whether or not you found the song that you want. If you don't find it, you move to the next station and you, you know, iteratively do this until you find what you're looking for. So it's exactly almost exactly what we're doing for this type of experiment. We don't know what frequency we're looking for for the axion, but we have some antenna that um, can can essentially hear the axion at specific frequencies, and we're tuning through this kind of frequency space, looking for axions at all of these different frequencies. Um, in addition to that, uh, like I said, this signal is very, very, very tiny, and so you have to sit there and listen for a long time. Although you can do some things to reduce the amount of time that you have to listen to at each of those specific frequencies. Um, the first thing you can do, actually one of the major things that interferes with our ability to look for such tiny signals is that even just matter at you know, room temperature or any temperature, it's actually emitting a little tiny bit of, of uh, uh, radiation at these specific radio frequencies that we're looking for. And so this kind of is the main interference with the signal that we're looking for. 
And so the first thing we do to kind of reduce this background radiation or background radio frequencies um, from interfering with our, our measurement of the axion is we put this whole experiment inside of a very, very cold fridge. And so for this, we're using what we call a dilution fridge that can get us down to something like tens of millikelvin um, uh, temperatures, which, you know, is very, very, very cold. It's basically the, the coldest you can get using some type of a commercial product called a dilution refrigerator. And you can actually see that and even hear this in the background. So this kind of monotone pulsing you might be able to hear through my microphone is the pulse tube, which lets us pull um, this uh, dilution fridge down to those millikelvin temperatures. And you can then see kind of in the back of my lab, you're actually seeing the top of this dilution fridge, which kind of extends down into a second story of, of this, um, this lab space that I'm working in. Um, and this reduction of the temperature, again, reduces the amount of kind of black body radiation that we are emitting from uh, uh, the walls of our antenna, essentially. Uh, in addition to that, we can do some fancy techniques to reduce the noise in our, uh, the way we detect the radiation coming out of our, or the uh, signals coming out of our detector. Uh, for this, we use very fancy amplifiers. Um, these amplifiers essentially let us get down to uh, noises that approach essentially what we would call the quantum limit of noise. Basically, this is the lowest level of noise you could get just from what you would expect from quantum mechanics. Um, this is essentially the best you can possibly think of doing. Um, in addition to that, we can use these amplifiers in very fancy ways uh, to even um, kind of cheat a little bit. You can't quite beat the quantum limit in a sense, but you can do some somewhat better than that uh, by playing some games with how you read out your um, uh, your signal. And so what we call, we do this without going all the details, we, this is called quantum squeezing and it lets us get some additional enhancement beyond just what you would expect from this quantum limited amplification techniques. Um, the, the main point here, which uh, I want to convey is that we're doing really fancy things with, uh, with quantum amplification. And this is where we kind of get this uh, kind of buzzword type thing of quantum um, enhancement. And th this again, lets us reduce our noise below what you would expect uh, uh to, to levels that let us kind of essentially look for the axon faster. So at any given frequency, our noise is lower and we have to sit there less amount of time to listen to see if we hear the axion signal more or less. Um, and again, you can kind of see all of the electronics that we use to both communicate with our detector to kind of uh, set up and, and, and uh, uh, read out those amplifiers. Um, you can see some of the electronics that we use to read out signals coming out of our antenna um, and things like that. And so I think uh, that kind of gives you a basic picture of what you're seeing in the lab. Again, this is kind of the electronic rack that we're using to do all of the, you know, communicate and set things into the, our detector, kind of read things out of our detector. And over here, you're seeing essentially the top of the uh, refrigerator that we use to cool down to those, uh, you know, mill Kelvin, very, you know, very low temperature, um, a little very low temperatures to really reduce down that, uh, the, you know, background radiation we're seeing. Um, and so that's kind of the basic picture of what we're doing here in the Haystack experiment. Um, and I think uh, with that, I can uh, have Victoria move on to the uh, next lab. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so we're going to go back to Sabrina now, who's going to talk to us about Ray. Mm -hmm. Yes, hello, do you see me? Do you see my screen? I mean, myself, yeah. Do you hear me? Okay, so I'm back, and now I will want to show you what we're doing here in uh, the experiment that I'm working with on, which is called Ray, meaning uh, readers at Yale. Uh, essentially, we are looking for the same kind of dark matter that Mike just explained, which is axions, but we want to do that with a different technique. Essentially, we are not using the uh, quantum sensors that he was talking about. We want to use atoms and we are not going to use any atoms we are going to use uh potassium atoms and we are going to excite the last electron of the uh potassium atoms into a very high energy state and that is what we are going to call river atoms which is the r of uh what i just uh, mentioned in the name of our experiment river at yale um the idea is that we have these river atoms uh, prepared in a certain state, so we just bring the electron to a you know to a level that we know very well, and 
we will go to create the beam of these atoms, and then we are going to try to detect one of those atoms. And the idea is that we are going to see what is the state of that atom. So if nothing happened, if there was no action, there was no dark matter, then we should see exactly what we prepare, right? Uh, because nothing happened. So why should something change? But if there was an axiom passing by, then we would be able to see something different. And that's because axions, when we create an environment in which the axions can switch into light, into photons, those photons will be interacting with the atoms. Essentially, the photons will be absorbed and the atom will you know, be excited, will change its state into a higher energy state. So if we see our atoms that are suddenly in a state which is not the state that we prepare them in, then we can say, okay, it is possible that an action was there and that we have detected dark matter. So this sounds somewhat easy and straightforward, but it is not so easy. Uh, I should say that our experiment is being built right now. We are not running yet. We're not ready to detect dark matter. We are at the stage of creating our beam of atoms and at the stage of creating the detector that we are going to use to see if those atoms were in the state at which we prepare them or not. So I would just like to see you, to, to show you what we have over here. This is uh, an optics table. And what you see here, this is all part of the setup to just create a beam of potassium atoms. And what you see here are uh, enormous types of mirrors and lenses because we have to use lasers to work with the atoms. Essentially, if you want to work with atoms, you we are going to have to work with lenses and mirrors, and that's why I'm wearing these glasses. Uh, we have very, very powerful lasers over here, and it's a hazard because those those lasers can uh, essentially, you know, burn your skin if they if they touch you. So we have to wear safety glasses in case there's a beam that just you know goes into your eye without you realizing it. Because another thing is that these lasers have a frequency, so a color that we can we don't see with our own eyes. So we don't know if the laser beam is perhaps going to, you know, come through and, and hit us in the skin or in our eyes. We just don't see that. So we have to be safe and make sure that that does not happen. Um, so essentially, what I have here is just mirrors and lenses that we use to be able to come to this other part of the setup that I'm showing over here. And this is where we will have our beam of atoms created. And another part of the setup, which is which is um, upstairs or downstairs, sorry, is where we have the uh, detection part. So this is very exciting because the technique that we are uh, planning to use to, for this experiment hasn't really been done before. I mean, there's a precedent of an experiment that tried to do that with, with the different atoms and a slightly different setup, um, but they had issues with, you know, that they could not prepare properly the, the states that they wanted their atoms in. So they they didn't manage to see any actions. So we're going to try that again, and hopefully we will, you know, make sure that we do not have the same issues that they have, and see if we can actually see the the actions this time. Another nice feature, as as Mike mentioned before, the action has a mass that we do not know what that is. It has a very large range. It could be essentially anything, and it is impossible to have one experiment that probes a full range of possible masses of what the action could be. So Haystack is focused on a specific set of frequencies or masses, and we are going to probe an absolutely different uh, set of frequencies 
and hopefully is uh well hopefully we find it it's that the range of frequencies or, or masses that we're going to search the axion in is predicted as a good candidate for uh, by the theorists so perhaps we have good chances of finding the axiom, but this we don't know yet, and we will not know for, I don't know, I guess a couple of years, because building an experiment from scratch takes a really, really long time, and, uh, and uh, it takes a lot of uh, hard work, but it's also a lot of fun, because we come here, we play with lasers, we do simulations on the computer, then we can compare, you know, what we simulate with uh, with what we see in real life, and then we can learn something. And not only, I mean, even though the ultimate goal is to see if we can detect dark matter, on the way of getting there, we learn many, many things. We we learn things we did not expect we were going to to see or to find. Uh, and that's what makes it so exciting to come to work every day. Uh, so I guess that. With that, I can wrap up this part of uh, of the talk. And I go back now to Victoria uh, for the next uh, speaker. Thank you. Hi. So I'm in the lab here with Dave Moore and Yuhan Tseng. Um, and they're going to talk about their simple experiment, or actually, it's a new experiment called Quibs. So they'll tell you about that. Okay, hey, thanks, Victoria. Uh, and hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, another stop on the Dark Matter Day tour. So I'm David Moore. I'm a, a professor of physics here at Yale. Um, and uh, next to me is Yuhan Seng. He's a graduate student in our lab. Um, and this is also an optics lab looking for dark matter. So you just saw in Sabrina's talk a really nice description of their optical table, uh, where they have a bunch of lasers and mirrors and a vacuum chamber. Uh, we also have a bunch of lasers and mirrors and vacuum chamber that you're seeing behind me here. Um, but instead of trapping kind of single atoms, really, really tiny things, we're trapping things, uh, we're, we're also like, you know, addressing things with our lasers, uh, but we're trapping things much bigger than an atom, but still tiny. Um, so what we have is that we have an optical tweezers uh, where we have a laser, it's an invisible laser in the infrared, uh, similar to what you heard about before. That's why we have the fancy eyewear so that uh, none of that light can get in our eyes. Um, and if we focus that laser, we can actually trap a tiny glass particle. So just the normal glass you'd have, you know, in your window or anywhere else, you can make a really tiny particle that's a micron or a tenth of a micron. So, you know, one one hundredth the width of your hair, a little tiny ball of glass. And in a focused laser, you can hold that up and float it in space. So we actually levitate uh, these tiny glass particles um, in the center of this uh, uh, shiny stainless steel chamber that you uh, can kind of see maybe in the center uh, of the optical table there. So inside, actually right now, Yuhan has trapped a particle. So there is a tiny 100 nanometer uh, sphere floating in the in the laser inside that. And we pump that chamber out to vacuum so, uh, so that there's no air collisions bouncing around the sphere. Uh, you heard from uh, Mike at, about Haystack, how they cool their whole system down to, you know, uh, just thousands of a degree above absolute zero. Here, we don't have to cool our chamber down, but we can still get this thing extremely well isolated and cold um, just by getting rid of the air in the chamber. Uh, so there's no gas particles hitting the sphere at all. Um, and it can have a temperature actually even colder than we could physically cool anything. So it can cool to millionths of a degree above absolute zero. So it's as still as though it were, you know, just, you know, one one thousandth uh, the temperature in a dilution fridge or, um, you know, another system like that that is a real refrigerator. And then once you have that really still, uh, incredibly stable particle sitting in the center of the vacuum chamber, that's what you need to kind of imagine uh, being able to detect these really tiny interactions we might have from dark matter. Um, so there's a really still particle sitting in that chamber. Um, and then here on Earth, as the Earth goes through the halo of dark matter around the Milky Way, um, maybe one of those dark matter particles flies by our sphere. It hits the sphere and just gives it a little kick. So what we're looking for is just this little sphere that's sitting there completely still to just get a little bump. And then we measure as it moves. Um, and, and we're able to tell it got some you know, kick from something we didn't see. And we only saw the effect of it interacting with the uh, particle in our trap. So this would be really exciting if we could see something like this. 
Uh, and there's lots of types of dark matter where maybe this is one way to look for it that uh, we wouldn't be able to see it with some of the other uh, types of detectors you heard about today. So it's a really challenging field in that, you know, there's lots of different ideas for what dark matter could be. And uh, we need lots of different experiments in order to search for them all. Um, so uh, so right now we're, you know, building some of these, uh, these particle detectors for dark matter. And uh, we have maybe one of these little tiny nanoparticles or nanospheres in our in our trap, and then uh, we want to go to larger and larger arrays of these particles, so we can have maybe tens or hundreds or thousands of these particles all sitting there uh, in the center of our vacuum chamber, waiting for a particle to give them a dark matter particle to give them a kick, uh, and then we might see that. So one of the real hopes with this experiment, if we can do it, if you think about this, this is maybe like this the kind of simplest way, quote unquote, simplest way you could think about detecting dark matter. You just have a mass sitting there in the lab. It gets hit and it gets a little kick. Um, the nice thing about doing it this way is that if we do ever see such signals from uh, these kinds of particles, um, then we'll be able to measure the direction uh, that those particles are getting kicked. And it turns out that actually dark matter, we expect to be coming all from a single direction. So as we sit on Earth, um, we're sitting in a, a spiral arm of the galaxy uh, going around the sun. Uh, and as the sun is moving toward through the halo of dark matter, kind of enveloping uh, the Milky Way, uh, we see like a wind, we call it a, a dark matter wind uh, coming, it turns out, from the direction of the constellation Cygnus in the sky. So if we were to see a signal in these experiments, uh, sitting here in the lab, we saw these kicks start to happen to our particles. And then we reconstructed as the Earth turns throughout the day that all these kicks were opposite the direction of the constellation Cygnus up in the sky. It would be really uh, complete proof that these little tiny uh, uh, momentum transfers to our spheres or little bumps we get in our spheres are coming from something, you know, in the galaxy, something that, you know, essentially ha would have to be dark matter. Uh, so we call this the smoking gun signal for dark matter. If we could do this kind of directionally sensitive detection uh, throughout the day uh, from these dark matter uh, particles coming from a, a specific space uh, in the galaxy. So that would be really cool. Um, and uh, this is maybe a, you know, a new experiment we're just getting set up, but we're hoping to really uh, make it to be, you know, uh, enough sensors that we could see something someday. So I think that's all I had. Um, let's see if Victoria is back online. Not I can show you a little bit more uh, while we're waiting for um, uh, a little bit more how the experiment looks. Um, so uh, we have some of the uh, pretty pretty scary lasers in this lab as well. So um, uh, for our normal lasers, we use maybe uh, about 100 milliwatts up to a watt of power to hold one of these particles and trap it against gravity. Um, so that would be a really bright laser. Like if you have your green laser pointer that you use to you know, give a talk or as a presentation, that's uh, five milliwatts or five thousandths of a watt. So we use like 100 or 1,000 times more light than that uh, for each particle. Um, but then, as I said, we want to make big arrays of these particles, so we have to go to Maybe if we want 100 particles and we have a, a watt for each, we have a 100 watt laser to try to lift 100 particles up against gravity. Um, and then we also uh, are able to do things like knock one electron off the particle at a time. We have to get these things uh, completely neutral so they have exactly the same number of protons and electrons on them. And uh, we do that, Yuhan's just set up a UV laser, uh, which is another invisible laser and a, another dangerous laser because it makes light that's uh, you know at the ultraviolet wavelengths that we can't see. and you know, can ionize our skin and burn our skin or definitely our eyes. Um, and we use that to ionize the particle and knock electrons off one at a time. So so one of the fun things, but you of course also have to be quite respectful of them uh, that we get to do is, is play with these kinds of very uh, impressive and powerful lasers in this lab. So I see Victoria's back. Um, I don't know if you wanna introduce the next topic. Victoria, you might be on mute. Uh, yes, hi. So I was just showing you where this is the outside of our lab a little bit. It's actually the back of the lab. And we're in a bunker here, uh, which was historically to protect the experiments that were in the particle accelerator that used to be here. So we're not talking about that because that got decommissioned and it isn't here anymore. But it 
is part of our legacy. So if you're interested in re hearing more about that, you can look it up on our website, on our about pages. It talks about our history. There's some videos about it. Um, but I'm going to take you over to Yinchin Hao now. So Yinchin. Hi, thanks, Victoria. Uh, hi, I'm Yinchen Hao. I'm a graduate student in Jack Harris lab. Um, in our lab, we do magnetically levitated helium drops in vacuum. So that's to say we have a vacuum chamber, which can we can pump down to 10 to the minus 6 millibar, which is a pretty nice vacuum. And it is also liquid cooled by liquid helium down to 1.5 Kelvin. Uh, that's not the best chirostat you can have, but that's good enough for to do our experiment. To negatively levitate the helium drop, we have a very strong magnet, which can generate a field of 15 Tesla, which is very, very strong. And that can generate enough magnetic force to levitate the drop against the gravity. And the result, when we, if we have a drop in vacuum that is a near perfect oscillator with almost no damping, and that's similar to what you just heard about the uh, limited silica, but we have uh, some advantage over that. The first is that the helium drop we levitated is larger. We can reach a uh, one millimeter diameter, which is that uh many times larger than the silica sphere and that can definitely give more signal and also liquid helium is well known for its chemical and structural purity the drop will evaporate itself inside vacuum and can reach hundreds of millikelvin above the zero at that temperature anything else other than helium will freeze and Helium at that temperature is also a superfluid, which means the solid impurities will just uh, move freely inside the helium drop and will just get out of the drop, which means the helium drop is very pure. There's nothing else than liquid helium. So we can reach also ultra low noise. Let me show you around the lab. So this is the first floor of the lab. We have two pyrostats on each side of the lab. These are the tubes we use to pump the helium and to transfer uh, helium into the pyrostat to form the drop. These are two bottles of liquid nitrogen. We need to transfer liquid nitrogen and liquid helium in a daily, uh, in a routine basis to cool down the drawer. Let me also walk you down to the basement of the lab where we have the optics and the magnet. And uh, to detect the drop movement, we are not just look at the drop by eyes, we are detecting the drop with the lasers. Here we have uh, some lasers. We couple the laser into a optical fiber. And the fibers, well, goes to here. That's the part I'm working on now. We reflect the lasers with some mirrors. It's sort of safe if the lasers are blocked and into the chamber. This cylinder here is a magnet. It's, when it's on, it's pretty dangerous to stand here because you can actually feel the pull of the magnet inside if you held anything magnetic here. And this is another Kyle stat. They are the same. We can do uh, two experiments at the same time. So the scientific goal we want to reach is that one goal is our experiments can use to detect the dark matter. A certain type of dark matter model is the mini charged particles. In this model, the dark matters can interact with each other with some dark charge, but this dark charge cannot be filled by the ordinary matter. 
when the dark matters are interacting with the ordinary matter, they behave like they have a many charged particles, which means they have a charge which is much smaller than electrons. We know that the charge in ordinary matter must be an uh, integral times of the charge of the electron. If we found any particle which has a not integer char charge, that is some particle beyond the standard model, and this could be a candidate of the dark matter. So uh, when we have our liquid helium drop in a vacuum, and the helium atom may happen to trap a dark particle inside it. That means this helium atom will have uh, probably a little bit more charge than the other helium atom. And we can drive the helium drop with the electric field. So the, park dark, so the dark particle with the helium atom will oscillate inside the helium drop. And because the helium is superfluid, there's no drag on and no loss. So the oscillation will be in sync with the electric field and will be amplified. Thus, we can measure the oscillation of the helium drop to get the charge density inside the helium drop and to examine whether we see anything with a middle charged particle. In our lab, we also do optical mechanics, which is like to couple the light, which is a quantum oscillator, with a mechanical oscillator. In this, in our case, it's a levitated helium drop. By doing this, we can explore some fundamentals of the quantum physics, which is also fun. Uh, now we are still at the early, early stage of the experiments. We have just started uh, a year, less than a year ago. We have just found the right way to levitate the helium drop inside a vacuum, and we can reach as large as one millimeter diameter drop. And you see, I'm just working on trying to start to coupling the light into the helium drop. And I think we are going to about to do that, uh, achieve that shortly. And the experiments in our lab are, are very hard, but it's also very fun. You can do a lot of hand-on things. And I think it's very rewarding if you like to do experiments. And it's very exciting when you get your first data, which looks very nice. And it's, uh, yeah very rewarding. Okay, that's all I have. Uh, I would like to hand it back to Victoria. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I think, I think Victoria has left us, but I'm going to take over for her uh, for our short Q&A session. So really quickly, can I get a thumbs up if you can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. I wanna request that uh, all of our researchers turn their cameras on. You can stay muted, but um, for the Q&A session, uh, if there's any questions from the teachers and the students listening, uh, please start sending them in the chat and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the next 15 minutes or so. And uh, as everyone is sending their questions in the chat, I guess I'll introduce myself because you haven't seen me yet. My name is Caitlin Hansen. I also work in the physics department, but I am on the instructional side. So if you were to come to Yale and take an undergraduate physics class, I'd probably work with you in your undergraduate uh, physics lab space. So maybe uh, one day we'll meet in person if any of you make it to uh, come to Yale. So let's see. Um, questions. Uh, okay, let's see. I see. Uh, can your experiment detect axions as well, or just the charged dark matter? Uh, okay, uh, I have to admit I'm not an expert for dark matter. I'm mostly doing optics. Uh, I don't think so. 
I think our goal is to charge to detect charged particles. That's our main goal. But I'm not 100% sure. Perhaps as we're waiting for more questions, I can just ask the researchers on camera, maybe some of you can share uh, what a typical day is like in your lab. Sabrina, you wanna answer? Yes. Um, okay, so a typical day in the lab, you know, varies a lot depending on what's the task at hand. Um, so in general, we have uh, quite a few meetings per week because we have to, you know, first of all, discuss with the group, what is it that we're doing? Uh, what are the next steps that we want to take? And, you know, we have to sort of evaluate what are the best courses of action depending on many things. For instance, what is our experiment telling us or if there's something that is not working well or if we have to plan ahead for, you know, um, futures in papers and so on. So meetings are a big part of the day-to-day the -day life, I would say. Um, in addition to that, uh, I am personally working a lot in a, in a lab that it's not exactly the one I'm showing here. It's uh, in a different space. And over there, I work on building uh, the detection that I was mentioning before, the detection system. So I'm doing a lot of simulations on the computer, uh, trying to reproduce what we are, what we think we're going to see in the in the in our setup when the experiment is actually running, and I also work on building the the, the vacuum chamber and the, the, what the setup is going to look like and doing test measurements and so on. Um, we have another question. Perhaps should we? Yeah. Thanks, Sabrina. Let's see, I see there's a question from Wibble Cross student. What is the purpose of finding black matter? Why is it so important? Um, perhaps someone else can uh, jump in and take this question. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll take a shot at it, but others should also try. So um, it's a really good question. I mean, so the one thing about dark matter is that it really doesn't care about us. We, we think we're sitting here on earth and it's like flying through us and the rest of the Earth and out into the solar system and galaxy without ever interacting. Um, and so with something that's, you know, so weakly interacting with us, um, you know, it's really hard to anticipate uh, if there will be kind of, uh, you know, applications where, you know, someday, maybe in hundreds of years, it actually, you know, is practically important for people's lives. Um, that said, though, it, you know, many of us who do fundamental physics are just like really interested in figuring out like why, you know, why the universe is the way it is, why we're here. And in fact, if we didn't have dark matter, we wouldn't be here having this conversation. Um, because we think now from what we know about uh, the universe that in order for the galaxies and clusters of galaxies, all the structure in the universe to have formed in the first place, uh, long before there was any, any stars or galaxies in the universe, the dark matter, which uh, doesn't collide and interact with gas and other kind of normal matter, started falling in to form the gravitational wells that now we live inside and everything else in the universe fell into. So, uh, so in some sense, you know, it's maybe uh, maybe we should care because if it wasn't here, we wouldn't be here either. Um, but you know, it's also you know it's so elusive and so weakly interacting with us that. Um, that finding practical, you know, everyday uses where you're going to be, you know, using a dark matter, I don't know, uh, in your phone or anything like that is probably probably not around the corner. But you never know in physics. There's, you know, things that 100 years ago we thought would never have any practical use that we now uh, use, like Einstein's relativity is used in your GPS and your phone and other things like this. So it's hard to predict. Yeah, thanks. That's wonderful. Let's see, we got a few more questions. I see. Uh, have you ever heard anything in a frequency that indicates an axion? And what about axions indicates that you should detect them through frequencies? Yeah, so maybe I can quickly take a stab at that. So I guess I'll start with the second question first. So uh, what? why do we look for frequencies? And the answer to that is that, uh, so you may have learned at some point about this, like, particle wave duality of, of of light. Well, there's a similar concept for matter as well. Um, and the connection here is that, uh, you know, 
any particle with some mass still has some type of wave behavior. Typically for normal mass, it's so big that that wave-like behavior is very tiny. And so you don't have to worry that it can behave like a wave. For axions though, they're so tiny that this wave type behavior actually starts to matter some. And the way this works is that the mass itself is actually exactly the frequency that you're looking for. And so the reason we're looking for frequencies is just that this, this axion is so tiny with such small masses that the mass and the frequency are essentially the same thing. Um, and so that's why we're looking for frequency like things. And have we ever seen anything? The answer to that is, is no. Uh, we would have loved to have seen something. We've seen things that look like axions occasionally, but typically there's easy ways to determine that these things are really not the axion you're looking for. Um, and one of our main te uh, techniques for this is to detect the axion. One of the things I didn't tell you about was that we have to convert that axion first into something we can see. So to do this, we have to um, use a magnetic field to take that axion and convert it into a photon that we can then detect in our lab. Uh, uh, so the first thing we would do if we see something that looks like an axion is you can just turn that magnetic field down. Without that magnetic field, the axion can never convert into something you can actually physically see. And so if our signal stays, it doesn't go away when the field is off, we know it's not really an axion. And there's things that mimic this signal. For example, you know, 5G cellular networks emit frequencies at exactly the frequencies we're looking for. And so we typically see some types of, uh, you know, spikes or noises in our data that come from those type of sources. And again, they're very easy to, to veto in a sense because we just turn the field away. The signal persists and we know that it's not coming from this axion converted photons. Great, thanks. Let's see, we got a few more questions coming in. In the event that you do find and see dark matter, what would be the next step? No, if no one else wants to jump in, I'll jump in again. I mean, I, I think we would all be extremely excited and go have a party. I don't know. I mean, uh, it, you know, I think uh, it would be a huge discovery just to find something beyond the particles we know about in physics. Um, uh, but, you know, the story definitely doesn't end there. We would like, you know, in physics, there's all these interconnections between different ideas. And we'd like to understand how that dark matter particle fits into what we do know about the you know, the protons and electrons. I saw someone asked about quarks, the quarks that sit inside protons. Uh, so we have this like picture in physics that like, you know, has only grown over thousands of years of kind of interconnected ideas. And dark matter would be a really big piece of how we understand the fundamental building blocks of the universe and what makes up everything we see. Um, we also, the next step would be to really do astronomy, like map out, not just say that there's probably a halo of dark matter around the Milky Way, but really study where the dark matter is as we pass through it, you know, how it interacts, whether it's, you know, this blobby diffuse uh, uh, cloud around the Milky Way, or if it's, you know, if it somehow forms some structures or substructures. And, you know, it would be really exciting, I think, for any of us to go from detecting that it's there at all to really starting to learn about where it is, you know, in some detail. Yeah, and I think this leads actually uh, great into the next question about quarks and how many there are and how are they related to dark matter. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'll jump in again. So yeah, so quarks are really fascinating there. Uh, so we know about protons and neutrons and electrons from, you know, that's what makes us all up. Uh, but inside the protons and neutrons, we actually found that there's even smaller constituents, quarks, uh, and gluons, which are the forces, the kind of analog of the photon that holds them together. Um, so they're the, you know, the, the fundamental, really truly fundamental constituents of everything that's, you know, kind of the, the non-dark matter part of the universe, all the normal matter, the things that interact with us and, and give us mass and everything else. Um, so quarks were a big mystery and, it, you know, one of the last kind of fundamental pieces of the normal matter we, we found, uh, in part because quarks never like to be by themselves, except at high energy particle accelerators for vanishingly small amounts of time. So the quarks that are inside our protons and neutrons, there's three of them. We call them two up quarks and a down quark or two downs and an up, depending if it's a proton or neutron. But if you try to start pulling apart those quarks and try to separate them out of those protons or neutrons, it takes essentially infinite amounts of energy uh, to get them apart. So we never see them uh, by themselves, except for instant, like tiny instants in time. Uh, so we don't necessarily, we think that quarks make up the normal matter, uh, but we're pretty sure they don't make up the dark matter because if they were there in the early universe, 
they should have interacted with stuff in the same way that normal matter does. And they couldn't have fell into these big giant structures that the normal matter later fell into. So we really need dark matter to be fundamentally different than quarks and not interacting in the way it does. Yeah, it seems uh, if it's not obvious to everyone, there's a lot of unanswered questions still. And uh, I see there's a really good question about, can we learn anything about dark matter from the difference between the theorized and actual rotation of galaxies besides the hypothesis that it exists? So does anyone want to try to take a stab at that one? I guess there are things that we can learn. For instance, we know that dark matter makes up about 25% uh, of the universe. So by knowing how the galaxy rotates, we can know how much matter is missing. So how much matter we cannot see uh, because of the velocity of the rotation. And that tells us how much dark matter content there should be around. Uh, and that's how one of the, you know, there are many hints of dark matter, but that one in particular is one of the hints that tells us, okay, then how much matter is actually missing? So we can know more or less what we should expect and in terms of quantity uh, with respect to the you know normal matter uh, in the universe. And we also can learn, I guess, how, how it is gravitationally interacting with normal matter and where it is located more or less. Um, this is also something we can we can know, but we still don't know what it is. So we still do not see it. That, that's the, the like the only piece of the puzzle that is still missing. But there are things we can learn. Great, thanks, Sabrina. I see there's one final question. Uh, you mentioned that bumps are expected to come from the direction of the constellation Cygnus. Why is that location hypothesized? Yeah, so I mean, I can take that because I mentioned it. Uh, so, so this is just a peculiar fact about where we live in the Milky Way. So the Earth is sitting on a spiral arm in the outskirts of the Milky Way going around the sun. And the sun is also going around the center of the Milky Way, rotating around the galaxy uh, extremely fast, 300 kilometers per second. So, so really, really fast. Uh, but, you know, on galactic scales, it'll take billions of years to go all the way around the giant circumference of the galaxy. And it just turns out that that direction around the circumference of the, the Milky Way that the sun is going and pulling us along, if you look in that direction in the sky, that's the direction of Cygnus. So it's just a fact about Earth. If you were somewhere else in the galaxy, it would be coming from a different direction, but it's related to the fact we live in a spiral galaxy and we know which direction the sun is moving through that. Great, thanks. I'm just looking at the time, guys. It seems like we have only about a minute left. So I just want to say uh, thank you all for signing on and joining us here at Wright Lab today to celebrate Dark Matter Day, uh, the most important holiday of the day, of course. And uh, we will send everyone um, transcriptions from today's event. And we hope to hear from all of the students again and perhaps see you at future Wright Lab outreach events. And uh, thank you to our researchers. <laughs>